Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a neighbor, a friend, and a collaborator of mine, Dr. Cami Galeski, who is in the Department of Animal Science. She's in charge of the two-year um, horse program. She also is a member of the Animal Behavior and Welfare Group and has been responsible for improving um, equine welfare both in the U.S. and um, actually across the world. And I could say a lot of other things about her, but I think that sort of sums up the uh, the important things that Cami has done for the horse industry in the U.S. So, without further ado. Thank you, Elena. How's that for volume? Is it okay? Or is it still soft? Can you change it? Because I'm afraid if I put it up by my hair, then it'll be all noisy. Okay, how's that for volume? People can hear me okay? All right, very good. So I have been asked to talk about comparing some of the equine welfare issues in developing areas of the world and developed areas of the world. And I don't necessarily like those terms, um, but I have yet to figure out the perfect terms to describe the contrast I'm trying to do. So hopefully the next two slides will explain this a little bit better. So I've had a chance, a really interesting chance, to explore some different parts of the world where there are pockets of countries where equids, mules, hinnies, donkeys, horses, are still being used as fundamental draft animals for people that maybe are in very impoverished situations. So I've had a chance to go to parts of rural Mexico a few times, um, Mali in West Africa, which most of us have heard about quite recently, um, Honduras, and then right now I have a visiting scholar with me from Egypt, Ahmed Major Neaton. <laughs> so um, I actually have to leave shortly after my talk to go teach out at the horse farm, but you may have some questions that you want to ask Ahmed in terms of Egyptian working at with welfare. But as I started studying this, I realized um, basically 80% of the equids in the, in the world are used in these developing regions of the world used fundamentally to help produce income for very, very poor families. So everything that I had ever learned about horse welfare kind of got turned upside down on its head in the year 2000 when I went to Brazil the first time and actually started working with this set of working equids. So most of you that maybe will go into equine veterinary practices are going to be working with really a very small percent of the horses that are around the world. And then on the other side, my background comes from having over 40 years of being involved with 4-H and Pony Club, showing open and breed circuits. Um, we did Arabian racing for several years out at the university. And then I'm also in charge of checking on my student interns for the two-year horse management program. So since 1991, every summer, I go and check on where they do their internships. So when I calculate it, it's something like over 250 different horse farms. And that ranges from quarter horse reining farms down in Texas to dressage farms out in Pennsylvania, reining farms down in Florida, uh, dude ranches out in Colorado, a little bit of everything. So I don't necessarily have a uh, high level of expertise in very many areas, but a little bit of expertise in a whole bunch of areas. Um, also, starting, when was it, 2003, became very involved with a growing movement that was called equitation science. And this group was looking at how can we use evidence-based research to enhance equine welfare and equine behavior, and especially in terms of horses used in the competition world. So I became very involved with that. Somehow 
kind of got suckered into now hosting three of their different conferences. And then this last year actually was elected to be president of that international society. So that's also given me a little bit of perspective on some of the equine welfare hot topics. So kind of talked and talked and talked about five freedoms. So I will be coming back to that from time to time. So I'm going to kind of jump back and forth. If we're in some of these more developing regions of the world, insufficient nutrition is a huge problem. Just plain getting enough calories into these animals is very, very difficult. Um, and sometimes it's because the people don't have enough income to buy the grain products or forage products that the animals need. Sometimes it's because the animal doesn't have enough time to forage appropriately based on how much time they spend working. And sometimes it's because, like in what we saw in southern Brazil, was the people were so nervous about their animal being stolen that it went directly from work to being put into a shed. So it basically never had the opportunity to just go ahead and graze and graze and graze. So it was not surprising that a lot of those horses were really skinny. Um, and Brazil's sort of interesting because on the one hand, you've got these just amazing show horses, they're show jumpers, they're Arabian halter horses and so forth, but you've still got these little regions where they're very reliant on the horse to do their work. On the flip side, a lot of us can relate to the fact that if we take the US or Canada um, or the UK, we might have this huge problem with overnutrition. And in many ways, even though it is not offensive as offensive to our eyes in many cases. You know, pretty much everybody freaks out when they see a horse's rib showing or a donkey's rib showing. But from a health standpoint, there may be at least as much problem with this donkey with the ponds of fat all over it as compared to a donkey that's a little bit on the skinny side. But this one does not cause the same number of phone calls to animal patrols as what those really skinny animals do. Um, this is primarily a problem in those developing areas, just insufficient or inadequate water. But occasionally we also run into that in other areas. When we were down in Brazil, we tested a bunch of the water and a lot of it had leptospirosis, or we test positive for leptospirosis. So that was one problem, is just getting an appropriate quality of water for these animals. And as we tested for dehydration, Especially these animals that are working in hot climates, um, very, very high percent of these animals showing heat stress indicators, showing levels of dehydration. Um, and that's something that, as we have groups try to work and help these different areas, that's a pretty easy, fairly inexpensive way to do a lot of welfare assistance. Little to no salt has been a problem especially with the horse populations. We don't know as much about how much salt donkeys really truly need. Um, someday it's a research project I hope to do, but just hasn't managed to make it on the list of things that get done quite yet. Horses we know have a fairly high demand for salt as compared to some of these other equids, but with the mules it's a question mark, and with the donkeys it's a bit of a question mark. Um, but in general, in the US, the UK, Canada, Western Europe, most of the time the donkeys, the mules are going to be getting salt, um, so we're still assuming that that's a need. Again, flip side, we go a little bit crazy with over supplementing, and as I talk to my students, I would say in general, we are really addicted to foo foo dust. And it surprises me all the time how little proof someone needs to go out and buy new supplements. And sometimes those supplements are really expensive. And especially, again, when I'm thinking how much that 50 cents per day that you're spending on foo foo dust could help my little donkey over in Egypt, it gets a little bit frustrating. Um, there are a handful of supplements where there's some decent research out there. But in general, please help your clients over the years not to go crazy for all the foo-foo dust that's out there. And if there are supplement manufacturers here, I apologize. Hopefully you're one of the supplements that's one of the really good ones. 
very little deworming if we go back to these developing areas. And, you know, so what little bit of nutrition these critters are getting is being snatched away by the parasites. Um, so Ahmed did some work in Egypt that was really interesting where he compared um, liquid ivermectin that was dosed in the mouth, liquid fenbendazole that was dosed in the mouth, and then ivermectin tablets that he would mix with a little handful of feed. One of the problems with these working aquids is in many of the areas, their life is really, really tough, and their handlers don't always know a lot about being kind and gentle. So a lot of these working aquids are actually really, really hard to approach and really hard to dose with something like an oral medication. Whereas when you have something mixed with feed, that might be the only feed they've seen in the last 12 hours. So then they're really excited. So uh, what he saw was a really, really high rate of getting rid of the parasites when he used the ivermectin tablets. And um, as compared to with the liquid, you know, a lot of times they were spitting it out, or especially with the mules, it was hard to even just get it into their mouth. So that was kind of a problem with the, with the deworming. And just the egg counts are insanely high compared to what we would expect to see, um, you know, in a backyard field here in Michigan. So, sorry that the hyperlink comes out blue. What that is is just a link to the AAEP parasite deworming guidelines. You guys probably all have clicked on that maybe multiple times even. But I find this one kind of I don't know, it's intriguing as I talk with my students. Basically, we got into this habit of let's just deworm either every three months or every two months. You know, people had different protocols, but that became very automatic. Every now and then you switched up products, and maybe for 15 years, people just thought they were doing an awesome job. And then we started reading these things about resistance of the parasites and what was going to happen if we kept doing it that way. And I've seen some of the other species catch on to this a little faster. But from what I can tell, again, in talking to my horse students, this is taking a lot of effort to try to get horse-owning public to buy into this idea. We have a really big problem in terms of doing strategic deworming. So, I've been trying to preach and preach to the students. Hopefully that slowly gets out to other people. I know you guys are hearing it in vet school all the time. Um, as far as this idea of looking into fecal egg counts and doing more of a strategic deworming program. Okay, going back again to some of our uh, working equids, we have a lot of problems with lesions. And a lot of times the harness is very crude, made of harsh materials, maybe not fitting very well. Sometimes they've taken materials that were supposed to be for oxen and just kind of smacked them onto the donkeys. Obviously that doesn't fit very well. So you get harness lesions all over the place, and yet the animal still has to keep working. So anytime you've had a blister break open and you have to keep walking or keep dancing or whatever it might be, um, it's not comfortable. So this is a huge welfare problem. Sometimes, you know, the first couple of trips I took, I couldn't figure out why they had these lesions on their knees. That was just not lesions I was used to seeing. And I finally figured out a lot of these animals are so exhausted, they start falling. So the, the lesions on their knees are simply from exhaustion-based falling most of the time or being asked to pull something heavier than they can actually pull if they're going uphill a little bit, not uncommon to crash down on their knees. Sadly, we see some lesions, but pretty much the only thing you can surmise is that the animal was being beaten. And I've even read a few little things that you can find, obviously not in a referee journal, but as you're reading blogs and so forth, there's a couple countries where people have even found evidence they're using sticks with nails pounded into them, and then they're using that type of stick with nails to prod the donkey or the mule to go forward. Um, usually the horses don't require quite the same level of beating, but they have other problems that they deal with. For example, they have a lot more trouble dealing with the heat, and they have a lot more trouble dealing with lack of food. Now, I go 
don't like those harness lesions. I don't like the poorly fitted bridle lesions. But at least I have some understanding when I'm working with those populations why that's maybe happening and why their resources are so bad that it happens. What makes me really, really furious, one of my many soapboxes, is when I see things like spur marks, bit marks, curb chain marks um, in our horses at the Michigan Pavilion or whatever show site I might go to. Um, I go to a lot of horse shows. Most of the time, people don't realize that I'm always kind of having my welfare frame of re reference on. And so sometimes they tell me things that I'd really rather not know. Um, the spur marks, for example, and I know you guys can't see it awesomely in here, those were sent to me from a student that was out on an internship. And she said, hey, thought you might want this picture of what just came back to me from the work pen. Um, so a horse that just in one riding session was bloodied up to that level, I, I just find that absolutely horrifying that somebody would do that on purpose with their spurs to this horse. Um, no, that is right behind the elbow. Yep. And then obviously the other one is the curved chain area. Um, some of you might have heard about a case, I think it was about two years, Shirley Roth and Kissing the Girls was the name of the horse, and we won't go into it a lot, but basically she had spurred this horse so much that it had sores the size of small plates on each side of its body. Um, and the owner got a little suspicious because the horse didn't come into the Western Pleasure class where it was supposed to get shown. And uh, upon further review, they found this horse, I think it was down in the stall actually, with the bloody sides, and they had tried to fix it with using like fake hair. She'd actually harvested some hair from the belly line and was trying to glue it onto these bloody spots on the horse's side. So those are the sort of things that horrify me that we could do to something um, as grand as the horse. So again, we're gonna go back to where these equids are working in Egypt or India or Pakistan, and just the issue of overworking or overloading. Um, some of Ahmed's work has shown that the mules are able to handle working in the brick kilns better than the donkeys. And I think, you know, it's hard to say, is that because of the hybrid vigor, that they're just a, more, a, a rougher, tougher animal? Or is it partly because the mules are bigger, and so they don't have, well, there's a little more of their mass to pull the same amount of bricks? Because as far as I understand it, they all have to pull the same amount of bricks. So it's a matter, if you have a bigger mule, he can probably pull that load a little bit better. And again, it's hard to get real upset with the people because their life is pretty darn awful as well. We do have some NGOs that are working really hard in this area. Um, the Brook, Spana, uh, Donkey Sanctuary, World Horse Welfare. Those are four of the big international groups that are trying to do educational programs, provide free deworming, free tetanus vaccines, and so forth to try to make life a little bit better for these working athletes. Again, going back to some of our horses, whether we're talking here or UK or Germany or whatever, one of my other big pet peeves is just having horses spend way too much time in stalls. Um, so over the weekend, if you happen to be on Facebook with me, and I know there's a handful of you guys out in the audience that are, I had taken a picture of my horses because that day we got like the nine inches of snow they went out, they ate their hay for a little bit, but then they went out and they started digging and pawing and putting their nose through the snow to get tiny, teeny little bits of grass. So here's this really strong motivation, even in challenging circumstances, to graze. Um, and as I've watched this over the years, I'm more and more convinced, you know, it's just so important that horses are out of their stall, at least some of the time, to do that kind of behavior. And so when I go to a competition barn, let's say to check on an intern, you know, it's one of my first questions, how much time do the horses get out of their stall each day? And there are a lot of farms where they do get out of their stall for a little while each day. 
but there's also some competition bars where they just don't, they, they stay in their stall, and their stall might be very beautiful, but it still doesn't allow for very many natural behaviors. And then they go to the indoor arena, they work for 45 minutes, and then they go back to their stall. And to me, that's probably not a horribly appropriate life for most horses. Um, so sometimes people will ask me, would you rather be a show horse in such and such industry, or would you rather be a working donkey? And, you know, that's a really hard question to answer. It's kind of like the show hole, bucking hole kind of scenario, because it depends on a whole bunch of factors. If I can be one of the well cared for working donkeys, obviously I'd much rather do that than be a not well cared for horse show. You've got a big range on all of these. Unfair training practices, uh, we alluded to that with the bloody sides and the, um, the curb chain area. In my mind, when I'm watching a warm-up pen, the warm-up pen at a horse show, I want to be able to try to interpret that that horse had a chance to make a correct choice before some sort of reinforcement or punishment was put upon to that horse. And a lot of times I have a really hard time figuring out what on earth they're asking the horse to do. Um, and we're, I've got a clip of it in just a little bit. Sometimes I can't tell that the horse had a chance to make a fair choice. So that's one of the things this equitation science group tries to do, is really emphasize learning theory. Do you understand how to use negative reinforcement? Do you understand where positive reinforcement might be appropriate? If you need to use punishment, do you know how and when to use that punishment? And so that's been really important. So we're going to do a few examples here. Um, I always tell my animal welfare class and my horse behavior and welfare class, I try very hard to be equal opportunity in who I pick on. So I try to pick a multitude of breeds. I try to pick a multitude of disciplines. So that people hopefully don't walk away thinking, oh, well, she just totally hates Appaloosas, or she just totally hates dressage horses, or whatever. So this one to me is one that probably 99% of the world can come to agreement, that soaring in the Tennessee walking horse industry is simply not appropriate. Um, if you're not familiar with this, basically they put caustic substances on the ankles and the heel area, especially of the front feet of these Tennessee walking horses. Um, and then they put some action devices also on those ankles that kind of make it hurt a little bit more. And the, the art of the thing is to try to make the horse equally sore on both front feet so that they never look lame on either one. They simply try really hard to get off of each front foot equally quickly. So I think this clip is just like three minutes. Um, so I want to show it a little bit in case you haven't seen it yet. Uh, many times, I'm always afraid to say stuff because I think we're being taped, right? <laughs> I'm not necessarily the world's biggest HSUS fan, but in terms of soaring, I think they've made some really good moves. And so this is actually a video that they put together. Step, producing the big lift. 
A 2011 HSUS undercover investigation exposed the cruelty behind these competitions. It led to a 52 count indictment against the trainer. And as a result, others in the industry kept a low profile, even as they continued to abuse horses. Tor Sports staff was no exception. Human hair thickening products and even spray paint were used to hide evidence of hair loss, scarring, and other signs of sore. And harmful chemicals were mixed into containers that would not raise the suspicion of onlookers, but should have raised serious suspicion with the horse's owners. Dozens of samples taken in this table tested positive for banned storage substances, revealing that hazardous chemicals, even toxic to organs, were being cooked into the horse's leg. Considering that some of Thor Sports trainers have committed previous soaring violations, our investigative findings come as no surprise. The soaring industry has survived for too long. For more than 50 years, Tennessee walking horses have been abused for profit. Time has come to end this cruelty and open up a new chapter in our treatment of Tennessee walking horses. So like I said, uh, probably 99% of the world sees something like that. I don't think there's really any ethical leg you can stand on to say, oh, I, I think that's okay, let's keep doing that. Some of the other disciplines, there's a wider a range of opinions. Um, we're only going to talk about rope hair a little bit. This is like a forced hyperflexion. Dressage gets blamed for it, but a lot of disciplines actually do this. Um, it's not terribly uncommon to see show jumpers being ridden in real care positions. And quite honestly, if you watch Western pleasure training, it's done a little differently, but it certainly resembles a lot like real care. Um, the Equitation Science Group actually took, I think, 54 research studies, and I believe it was 88% of those found that welfare was negatively impacted by riding horses in that forced position. And it's kind of like, well, duh. <laughs> but still, we have to provide evidence if we want to stop some of these things. So if you go to the Equitation Science website and you look under news and you type in position statements, there's actually a several page document that highlights some of that research on um, both physical and behavioral measures related to rural cure. About the past, what? Well, it mainly happened in October. Um, Western pleasure controversy went a little bit crazy on the internet. And it, Quarter Horse Congress in Columbus, Ohio, takes place during most of the month of October. And somebody posted a reasonably innocent Western pleasure video. And I'm going to show a little bit of that. So if you haven't seen Western pleasure done by Quarter Horses, you'll get an idea of what we're talking about. Um, and then I've got another clip that shows a little bit how some of that look is achieved. But it was just interesting because this is something that has kind of been on my radar for many, many years. And it's like all of a sudden, it, with the help of Facebook, it went totally, totally crazy. So that, that's been really interesting. Be jogging, increasing they'll be walking. 
Um, but apparently a lot of horse-loving people had not seen a Western Pleasure Quarter Horse class during the last 10 or so years. And so a number of them just were totally, completely mystified and or horrified when they saw this. Uh, like I said, when I saw it, I, I was kind of like, well, this has been going on forever. I'm not quite sure why all of a sudden this is upsetting. Oops, they're still open. And they're still open, okay. It takes a long time to lope when you're going that slow. <laughs> Closely. This is filming a warm-up pen for Quarter Horse Western Pleasure, um, I believe it was two years ago, and it's going to show some of the techniques that produce that really slow, really quiet horse from the last video. So if time allows, when questions, we'll get back to the Western Pleasure deal. Um, I try to break down some of these situations into training modifications as compared to aesthetic modifications. So I always find the tail deal really interesting to talk about, because it's almost like every breed or category has come up with some crazy way to deviate the tail. So in our stock breeds, um, you've got a semi-decent percent I know a few years ago it was 80 some percent. I'm not sure what the percent is right now. But they um, use a very high percent alcohol and inject it into the top of the tail. Everclear is something that gets used fairly often. And it will basically numb a lot of the responsiveness of the tail. So if you used to have a horse that was getting cranky and wanted to swish his tail and show irritation, now that tail just holds completely flat and still. For some reason, this was decided it was desirable, and it became highly copied. So it's completely against the rules. Um, at high-level shows, you might get caught, but at low-level shows, they normally don't have enough people to check on that. And then we've got our Arabian on the upper right, and what they were doing for a long time, and still to some degree, is they actually take ginger or other caustic substances, put it in the rectum, and then the tail gets held very high because there's a lot of irritation going on. It's completely illegal, but it was very hard to test for. Um, again, the last few years, it's getting better. 
I still think it's used a lot when people are doing their pictures because it seems to me like a lot of the pictures in the magazines um, have the tail held higher than when you just see them at the show. On the lower left is a saddle bread, and what they have done in many cases is they knit the sides of the muscles and ligaments along the tail, and then that horse will wear a brace most of the time when they're in their stall, and it makes that arch that the breed has decided is very desirable. So during that horse's show career, they're gonna pretty much have that brace on or be out in the show ring. And then on the bottom right is the dock horse tail. In Michigan, it is completely illegal to dock a tail, but you sure wouldn't know that if you go to a draft horse show because almost all of them will have dock tails. And sometimes they come up with clever things like, well, my horse got their tail stuck in the door of the stall. We had to have the vet amputate it. Um, you hear all sorts of things, and you will occasionally hear people that say, well, we have to dock, otherwise the horse gets its tail caught in the implements that we use it for, and it's just really dangerous. I find that interesting since a lot of the Amish people that actually use drag horses don't dock tails necessarily. Um, and I also don't understand why when we don't dock the tails of other driving horses, like even standard red harness racing horses, that somebody decided we absolutely must do it for draft horses. I still think it's a lot about the looks and the tradition of it. Oops, wrong. How am I doing? Okay. Um, People always ask me about how do I feel about racehorses, and they assume that I'm going to go crazy on the racehorses and tell them how horrible it is. Having done it for six years, having apprenticed with a couple race trainers, I don't think it's any worse than any other category of the horse industry, and I think in some cases it's sometimes done better. Um, there are some question marks about whether the two-year-olds should be raced at the level we race them. I don't always think trainers make the best decisions if they're under a lot of pressure from owners to get a horse into such and such a race at such and such a time. And I think a lot of it is the breakdowns when they happen are so dramatic and so often caught on television that it becomes very visible to us. Whereas if a Western pleasure or a reigning horse is no longer usable due to arthritis, nobody ever hears about that really. But the breakdown of racehorses is something that most of the world is exposed to. But the life of a young racehorse, especially if they're worth any decent amount of money, is actually pretty darn amazing. And the life of the retired racehorse, if they're worth much of anything, is pretty darn amazing. So the only part I really have a problem with is when they're living at the racing stable and really they never get out of their stall other than to go on the hot walker or have a short workout on the track. There's very few tracks in the country that have anywhere they can turn the horses up. But that's the part that actually troubles me the most. There are some breed associations that have adopted this equine welfare code. Um, but sometimes it feels like it's a lot of nice words and not necessarily tons and tons of action. I do know that the quarter horse industry is adding more stewards to their show. Um, dressage and show jumping have really kind of cracked down on the no blood rule. So if they see blood on the sides or blood on the mouth, um, chances are extraordinarily good you're going to be disqualified. So there are little glimpses of good, um, but we still have a long, long way to go. So I'm going to stop there so that maybe there's time for a couple questions. stop all these methods of like soaring and the no blood rule, how are uh, different associations going about stopping the behind the scenes? Because if there's a no blood rule, then when people just go and try to cover it up type of thing, is there a way um, that they're actually, actually trying to stop it before it happens? 
I mean, in my mind, we're not doing nearly enough for what happens at the home farm. We're making teeny, tiny, small bits of progress about what happens at warm-up pens. Um, for example, I think it's the Quarter Horse Association. They now do kind of like what happens at soccer, where you get a yellow card. And if you get X number of yellow cards, you might not be able to show for a certain period of time. Um, so that, at least, is progress. I've been very troubled by how nasty people will be to their horses in the warm-up pen. I can have my video camera out taping everybody in the ring, and they're so okay with what they're doing that they don't even, they don't even care. But, you know, in, in Candy's Perfect Utopia, there would be like little chips that are in these horses that somehow record all the training that happens at home. Or at least there would be video cameras all over the place. But Cammy's Utopia would take a lot of money. <laughs> um, have you seen any um, movement from the judges to maybe start, um, you know, placing more natural training methods higher than these artificial techniques? Um, I mean, there is a tendency to want to put a lot of blame on the judges, saying things like, well, if they didn't reward that type of horse behavior, we wouldn't have that created. And having done a fair bit of judging, what's hard is if all the big time trainers with all the super fancy horses have decided, hey, we're going to do something that's really hard for the amateur to, to do, Sometimes that's all that's there. So yeah, you have to decide if you're brave enough to not even place any horse in the whole class. I do know right now there's a horse, what is his name? It's a southern thing. It's a quarter horse. Um, his nickname is Moon Pie. And he and his owners are making a move to have a quarter horse western pleasure that goes a little faster than all those horses in the video. Now, it's, it's not the speed that I think they should go yet, but he's still passing everybody, and he is so good and of such high quality, he's actually getting in the top five in these Congress shows and these world shows. And to me, that that is really something that needs to happen. People with great quality horses need to start to make some of the statements. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, because these are trends in horse showing, and we'll see more trends, we'll see more extremists taking it a different way. What is the role of veterinarians? What can we do in terms of lawmaking or convincing of these owners that it's not completely ethical to do these practices? And that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I think you can have conversations with your clients about what it takes to be an ethical owner. That's one thing I try to really impress upon my students. It's like, all right, out of every group of 20, one of you is probably actually going to become wealthy and have fancy high dollar horses. I want you to be a responsible owner. I want you to go visit the trainer without announcing that you're gonna show up. I want you to go to shows, check the horse back in the barn, all those kind of things. Um, another thing, you know, this one troubled me a lot. I had a veterinarian one time tell me that they were still injecting horses' tails because they were afraid how many tails would get infected if they didn't do it. And that, I, I sort of marginally understand their argument, but I found it very troubling. So I, I think, you know, I know you guys have ethics classes a lot now. Well, I don't know about a lot, but, okay, they have one. <laughs> All right, well, we're making progress on the ethics class. Um, but I do think having those conversations with owners is really important. And, you know, when you have the opportunity, if somebody asks you, for example, to be on a stewards committee, even though it's going to be very time consuming, really think hard about whether, you know, can I afford the time to be part of that group that might make a difference. And I appreciate the trickle-down thought process there with the big guys, but quite honestly, I believe it belongs right next door, right in your 4-H ring, right with the person who's teaching your kid. Because locally, small shows, so much ridiculous pressure is put on those kids. I've seen the kids learn from their trainers, go out in that practice ring, and nobody says a word to them. Nobody. And there are times when I have said, uh, you know what, 
You either need to speak to the child, the leader, and the parent, or I'm going to go over there and make a scene because that's not what I want my kids to learn. Somebody has to stand for something. And if we say we do, then we need to do what we say. And that can start right locally. These same kids in that 4-H ring who are being taught to do exactly all the things you don't want them to do grow up to be the trainers and the big barn owners you're hoping to change later. Let's change them now. Why aren't we standing up now to the ones next to us, not the ones I don't know who have a budget I can't even comprehend, but the ones that I do know. We need to stand and say, you know what, guys, there is another way. And that's a great point, Bonnie. And I, I do think it needs to be very much a two-pronged approach. But yeah, your little kids are easier to influence, and their attitudes are more malleable. Um, it is not at all uncommon for me at a show to, if I see somebody snatching on a horse's mouth, I will walk right over to them and say, um, how, first of all, tell me what you're trying to ask the horse to do. Now tell me how what you're doing is going to make a difference. And I've had some moms get pretty mad at me. And then I've also had some moms sit right there and nod their head along with me. Yeah, it, it, or they had an idea, but for some reason their child doesn't respect their opinion about horses. And so that, that's been really interesting. The other thing that drives me crazy, and this is another um, fat one, is when I go to shows, especially smaller shows, like open shows, equestrian team shows, 4 H shows, and I see horses that are lame or lame-ish getting punished because they won't, for example, take the correct lead. And so that's another place. If you feel comfortable kind of politely intervening on the behalf of the horse, I think you can make a big difference. All right, I think I probably need to be done. Thanks, gang. Before